because you can't, you know, the, the guys aren't going to give you everything they've got if they don't think you've got their best interest at heart. Episode 114 featured Mike Gutlius, the head football coach at Catholic University. For more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe. I graduated in 1992 and um, and played here. It was, you know, a school I wanted to go to for a long time. And, um, the, you know, the Catholic side of things important to me. So that was, it was a good fit. So after I graduated, I coached here for a couple of years. And uh, then I thought maybe I wanted to coach in high school and, and do the teaching thing. And uh, I coached at Georgetown Prep just up the street for a couple of years. And they were we were really good, but that wasn't uh, the right fit. So I jumped back into college coaching. You know, as most of the guys, most coaches know, you got to go like you got to find the job where it is. You, you don't get to just pick where you want to live. And I didn't want to leave D.C. because I loved it here. But my first uh, full time coaching job was at. St. Norbert College in Wisconsin. So I moved there and that was a really cool place. Um, all the history of, you know, the Green Bay Packers and all that's kind of interwoven around that campus. So that was a great place to kind of cut my teeth. Um, then from there, I realized, you know, if I was going to do this, I probably need to get a master's degree. So I went back as a little bit older guy, I was a GA. Um, and I did that at University of Laverne in Southern California. So I went from the freezing ton frozen tundra of Green Bay to Southern California uh, and had a great experience there for a couple of years. But um, California was definitely not my style, like the LA, because University of Laverne's just east of LA. And um, so I thought, okay, I want to go to a little more traditional place. So I was lucky enough to jump on uh, Coach Reich, Joe Reich's staff um, down at Wingate University. And uh, he was taking over as the new head coach. And for a couple of years, I coached for him there. That was a great experience, great staff. Um, he just retired. Actually, he's a Gettysburg alum as well. Um, and then, uh, from there, I went and got my um, first like assistant head coach, defensive coordinator job at Concord University in West Virginia. And so went to that part of the country. It was an interesting place to live. It's uh, it's beautiful, but it really, you know, you're in the, the part of the country that used to be dominated by the coal industry, which isn't what it used to be. So it was, it was an interesting place to coach. Um, and then from there, I got hired to be the assistant head coach defensive coordinator at Lindsey Wilson College, which is an NAI school in Kentucky. And they were starting football from scratch. So that was a really interesting experience to be uh, at a place that didn't have football to start football. And we got good very quickly. Um, they did it right. Coach Chris Oliver was the head coach and had a great plan. And within five years, we were in the quarterfinals of the uh, playoff tournament wow. for NAI football. So, you know, that was it. And then, it was while I was there, um, the job at Catholic opened up and it was the fall of 2016. We had just gotten knocked out of the playoffs, I think maybe by Baker College from Kansas. And um, and I had applied for the Catholic job. It was, it was, you know, announced I applied for it and I realized that I really wanted it. So I called a couple other alums that I knew and made sure that uh, word was put in and I was selected to be in the interview process and was lucky enough to, to win the job. And uh, came back here and have been here now for six seasons. Um, you, you, I don't count the spring that we played a couple games or tried to play a couple games with COVID. But, um, you know, we just finished this past year, went five and five. And that's not what we wanted. But, um, you know, went six and five the year before, six and four the year before that. And so, you know, I'm, I am proud that it's, <laughs> it's since I think 2000 was the last time that the Catholic university football program had gone three seasons or more without having a losing season so wow. while that's not what you aim for um it is something to, to to keep track of so having had those many different experiences going from you know, the frozen tundra up at st norbert's all the way down to to la and then back out to the midwest what are some common themes that you've you've seen from some of the head coaches that you've worked under that you've taken with you to your current role as the head coach at catholic Right. No, that's, that's a great question. So I think um, I've worked for guys that were super organized. Um, I've worked for guys that were kind of looser on the organization and relied on their assistants to handle it. And, uh, you know, the, but I would say the one thing that I found with, with the successful coaches, when you, you know, when you're working for a, a guy who's doing well is the way they treat people and um, that they appreciate the players and that there's a mutual trust among them. And once that trust is there, you can have a better accountability. And I think um, the guys I've worked for, when it, when you know the coaches that cared for the, the players and 
that way, you know, through that love for the guys, they were able to connect at a deeper level um, so that you could push them harder because you can't, you know, the, the guys aren't going to give you everything they've got if they don't think you've got their best interest at heart. Um, and it has to be authentic. It's not like some poster on the wall. You know, you have to spend time with them. It's just like anything else in life. It's It's got to be the hard parts, the, you know, being with them when things are going wrong and then holding them accountable when, when they need to be held accountable and then um, being happy for them when things go right. That always goes back to the the one common thing that I hear a lot of times on the podcast, and that just comes back to relationships. The more that you can actually show that you care about the kids beyond just the game, like you were saying, the more prone they're going to be out to actually put everything they have on the line for you as the coach. Yeah, definitely. And it was, I think, and you know, the, the AFCA convention is a great resource to go to, especially for younger coaches. And it's a little bit... Um, too much you're just like it's a lot in your face but you know i remember uh in the one i went to it was probably late 90s i think and i went to a talk larry karras had just won his second or third national championship at mountain union and he was talking about um that one of the things he regretted early in his career is he didn't enjoy the kids you know and as he started to enjoy being around the guys and and, and doing that he became a better coach and I think that just goes, you know, hand in hand with um, if you enjoy being around them and you want to be around them and you spend time with the guys, they're going to they're going to feel it. And then they are going to give you more like everything they have. They're willing to put it on the line because they don't want to let you down. And, Definitely. Um, and I think that's a big part of, of taking a step. And so after that, I thought about it. I was like, you know, yeah, I, you don't want to look at them like um, you don't want your players to feel like that they're. uh just machines performing a duty and that you can interchange them. You know, they're, they're guys that have, you know, they have the moms and their dads and their brothers and their sisters and girls are going to dump them and, you know, yeah. all that. And, and you know what, like dogs are going to die at home and, and things are going to happen while we're at school. And what are you going to do about it? And if you just shrug your shoulders as the coach and go, I don't care, just, you know, make sure you don't jump off sides on third and one, um, then that's probably not going to lead to a lot of success. Yeah, and looking back at my career and, and the coaches that had the most impact on me, and, and we mentioned this off air when we were before we recorded, but Coach Streeter, he's one of the he's the the best example of somebody who takes a genuine interest in their players. And he's he's somebody who to this day I feel like I could call up and and ask for anything. So I, I greatly appreciate everything Coach Streeter and and some of the other coaches at Gettysburg provided because their their insights, their advice, their their guidance has not only helped us as their former players on the field and we were in school, but beyond graduation at this point. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Coach Streeter is an icon um, just because who coaches at a school, one school for that long? You know, I just ran through a laundry list of moving around, trying to find the right spot. And I, how many years was he the head coach? Was it was 30? No, I, I don't just, know. Just about 40. Yeah. So, OK, that's a ridiculous amount. You know, yeah. and it's in all of the young men that I'm and I've heard that from a lot of, of Gettysburg grads about uh, the influence he had. And he was doing it before it was really the way to coach. You know, he was a the sometimes the term players coach could be people use a derogatory meaning like maybe the guy's not strict. But I don't think that was him at all. He was one of those guys that was he was a player's coach before being a player's coach was cool. Exactly. Yeah. And it's funny. It's funny you say that because. One of my teammates, his dad actually played at Gettysburg. And coach Streeter was his coach back yeah. in the day. I'm sure it was cool for him to be able to see those multi generations of dads and then their sons playing. And and I'm sure that's like an icon level yeah. to, to be able to be at a program for that long. And his son's doing pretty well too. He's, he's doing a good job coaching. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny you say that about the that uh, a, a player's son was able to play for him again. I have several guys on my squad now that played that their dads played with me here at Catholic. And so I'm coaching their, my, my co, you know, players, kids, which is oh, a weird so thing. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's cool, you know, but it's a weird thing to think like, wow. Um, I still think I'm 25 years old. I don't think I'm, you know, I'm old now, but uh, today nothing brings it home more than when I see a guy graduating, who's the son of a guy I played with. 100% appreciate that and I'm still early in the career but just hearing about coaches talk about that it it really does put it in a perspective how much this game can shape a young person because you know you 
having been friends and, and teammates with guys that are dads of kids that you coach you now, you know, it, it really comes full circle. And I think that's really what makes football one of the greatest games out there. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's passion in every sport, I think. And you'll find, you know, you'll find people that are just, you know, like, uh, you know, the European soccer or, you know, in, in like cricket in India or something like that. There's people that are passionate about it, but there's no sport like football that requires so much sacrifice from so many people just to win one football game. And that lends itself to building those relationships at a level. I don't, I, I mean, I, maybe I, obviously I'm biased, but like <laughs> there's no other sport that does it. I mean, think about it. You know, we got a hundred and some man roster and we're going to get on the bus to go play, you know, up the road. We're going to go play Susquehanna or something like that. And I'm going to put 61, 62 guys on the bus to go play. And so that means almost half of the team is sitting back home. But if that half of the team doesn't give their all on a Tuesday practice, we don't have a chance. Yeah. No other sport asks you to sacrifice like that. I 100% agree. And and I'm biased too, but I mean, you, you just think about it from a sheer numbers standpoint. There's no other sport with, with that amount of players and that many moving parts that go into just winning one, one single game. Mm-hmm. And football, you know, especially Division Three football, you get 10 regular season opportunities. Um, and you're going to, you know, the guys, if they want to win, they're going to bust their butt year round just for 10 Saturdays in the fall, you know, and, and hopefully you get more. Yeah, uh, that's the plan. But, you know, every other sport, like, you know, I, I love baseball. It's a great, it's a great American pastime, you know, but I don't think of it as a national sport because, you know, Major League Baseball, they're going to play, what, 100, what, they play 160 games or something like that, 140? It's, yeah, 162. Yeah. I mean, holy cripes. Imagine, you know, like football, you only, I mean, that's why it hurts so bad when you lose on a Saturday. And you just, it just eats you up because you only get so many. And, right. uh, and I think, you know, having done this now, I, I have to work really hard to not let that become a sickness of like the, you know, yes, you want, you want to hurt from it because it matters but you can't live there. You have to learn from it and move on. So any last words, coach, you want to share with the audience today? Um, gosh, you know, it, uh, anytime I get a chance to talk about football is great. So that's really, you know, I'm glad we got to cover that because I think this is, this is a game. This is the last chance, honestly, in, in, um, you know, a different guy. I'm at the Catholic University of America, but this is the last chance to teach young men in America how to you know invest in something bigger than themselves and say that the team is more important than I am and I'm going to sacrifice for the team and um and and to me that sets them up to be good husbands and fathers because that's what and maybe it's not popular to say that anymore but that's what it is if you're going to be a good husband and father you're going to have to say something is more important than me um and I think football is one of the last training grounds for that yeah I, and I always say this on the podcast from from my experience as a player I really think that football Football is the perfect microcosm for life. Mm -hmm. And just like you were saying, you're going to learn how to, to devote yourself to something that's bigger than yourself and play for the other guy around you. But you learn how to go over adversity. And there's been countless times for me as a recent player, how many times I've had to deal with situations where I, I fall back on what I learned as a player. So I totally agree there too. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're, if you can make it through freshman year training camp and come out the other end, and 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 stick with it and and hurt and still get get up every day and you know you're lying in that bed in your dorm room and you're going oh my gosh is this the right place for me you know because you just got your clock cleaned earlier in the day and you're tired and your legs are sore and you you know okay is that the same as dealing with losing a family member or, or having someone really important you get sick no but it's a little you like you learn about yourself like hey i can do hard things Right. And, and so then when you do have something hard pop up in front of you, you're like, okay, if I work at this, I can handle this. Right. Instead of saying, uh, I, I, I need to go hide from this pain. Well, great conversation, coach. Really enjoyed it today. And best of luck to you all Catholic as you're, you know, continue on the recruiting trail.